Ja, välkomna hit till Spegelsalen och Grand Hotel för den här presentationen av Erika Oiler. Det här är en återkommande, återkommande händelse så att jag känner igen många av er, ni känner igen oss. Det är jättekul att det är så många som, som kommer hit idag och jag tror att det finns mycket frågor och jag hoppas att ni kommer få många svar. Ni har säkert varit med i Erika Oiler under en betydande tid och sett utvecklingen från förhoppningsbolag till ett bolag som har betydande reserv och projekt i Kenya. Så utan att säga något mer så kan vi bara nämna det praktiska. Det säga, när vi klarar den här presentationen så kommer det finnas smörgåsar och, och, och dryck här utanför och en rapport också tror jag, som kan vara delat oss lite grann. Och vi finns bara ta för att svara på ytterligare frågor. Vi uppmanar ändå att ställa de frågorna ni har i, i det här forumet så får alla höra svaren. Så med det så tack så mycket för att ni kommer hit så lämnar jag över till Afrika Hålls vd. Hej, right, thanks uh, Robert. And, uh, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, hope you like the new uh, fancy room we've got here. Uh, uh, hopefully you don't have to go in here. Uh, Thing, a portent of things to come. So maybe uh, maybe we uh, start with a little show of hands in the audience. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Hello? So maybe we start with a show of hands in the audience. What up? Everyone here that is really happy with today's share price because it gives a great buying opportunity, raise your hand. <laughs> Turn up the sound a bit. And we, English, <laughs> English, <laughs> English, <laughs> English, 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 Okay, is that better? Okay. So, uh, you know, I think uh, things like Kurdistan, first, all the Kurdistan stocks getting, getting wiped out, but I can't actually explain it. You know, when I, when I look at what we've done, We've had some mixed results. I think we've had some success in the Okachar Basin. Uh, I think we've, we've got some uh, uh, good things happening there. We, we have had some failures, uh, most notably the Chubahara Basin. I think that was, in the last six months to a year, that's the biggest failure I see, the biggest disappointment for us as management. But uh, I do think we're doing a, a lot of good things, and I think uh, when I run through this presentation, hopefully, We'll do the poll again and see how many people raise their hand and say thank you. This is a great buying opportunity, and uh, I'm very glad we came here tonight uh, because I do think it is, and I think uh, with the upcoming wells uh, and the basin openers. You know, honestly, I don't think our stock is going to get moved by anything to do in the local chart race. And uh, every time I announce a discovery, the stock goes up in the morning and comes down in the afternoon. Uh, every time an answer dry hold it goes down in the morning. Uh, or, uh, so we say a sub-commercial well, it comes up by the uh, end of the afternoon. So I think Lokachar is kind of priced into the stock. I think the thing that's going to move the stock from here on is basin opening wells. And 
we'll go through those and see. We're going to have five of them in the next six months. We're going to have up to 10 of them in the next 18 months. So uh, let's go through those and try to get people excited again and see if they get excited as I am about the stock. So again, we, we, we keep talking about the, the discoveries, and I think the reason we do is that is what is underpinning the value of the shares right now. So the, uh, the you know, our, our, our operator tell have come up with a number of 600 million barrels of uh, discovered oil. Um, our number is probably bigger than that. We're in the middle of doing a resource update. We will be coming out with a number before the end of the month. Uh, but that is an awful lot of oil. And, and we have exceeded threshold volumes. We are in the process of doing a field development plan. I think the pipeline is getting sorted out. The field development plan is sorting out. And I think we will see those reserves grow over the next six months to a year. So I think we just keep doing what we're doing there. Uh, this is a great block. Uh, once again, I get a lot of interest from all the big oil companies. I get a lot of interest from national oil companies. Uh, very few places in the world can you come and get a resource of this size with good contract terms, low operating costs, low development costs on shore uh, with a, a straight path to value. So we keep moving ahead on that. But I think the story still is an expiration story. I think basically the share price today, you, you can get significantly higher that just on what we found in the local chart basin. But I think uh, uh, the real story and the real upside of the stock is still an expiration. Not just in the new basin, but in the local chart basin itself. And we'll talk a bit about that as well. So everyone's seen this slide, I just can't help putting it up again, just to remind people how big this thing is. You know, the, the, the tertiary basin, which is where we're really starting to get focused now. Uh, we haven't had a lot of success in any basin other than the tertiary basins. Uh, and it's the size of the, the entire North Sea. So we've got 13 basins within the tertiary. All of them, similar basins, formed at the same time geologically. Uh, and once again, I think it's unreasonable to think that only one of these basins is going to work. And, almost, and even more unreasonable that we're smart enough to drill the only good basin first. So I still feel very strongly that there's going to be a number of other basins found. So um, the Lokachar Basin, I think we've had a very good success rate. You know, the String of Pearls, with the exception of the one well here at the Imong that was actually outside the basin, uh, have been a 100% discovery rate. Uh, we're getting ready to drill the last of the spring of pearls. It should spud today or tomorrow. I haven't seen from the field yet, but this one should be drilling ahead. Uh, a very interesting well. Uh, we are starting to see that there is a very a, a good sweet spot in this basin. Gammy and Amasink are going to be probably 70 to 75 percent of our reserves right now. And that's really the thickest, best reservoir. And that's where we will start uh, concentrating the development on this field. Uh, these fields are nice fields too, and will be tied in. Uh, the other side of the basin is a little less uh, exciting. You know, what we've seen there is thinner, poorer reservoirs, uh, but over big areas. So again, a lot of oil in place. We will spend more time and effort on that, but I think we're really now focused on what the, the easiest, best reservoirs are. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, ETOM, even though it didn't have a huge pay thickness, we saw a very good uh, result. And we had two concerns going up in the northern part of that basin. Number one, would the oil charge be able to make it up there? And two, was there a reservoir? The reservoirs had thinned a bit when we got to a gete, and we were a little worried that uh, as you move from the Twiga to a gete up here, that we might have seen a thin reservoir. But indeed, what we saw was about 400 meters of some of the best reservoir we've seen in the basin. So that's giving us a lot of confidence that this northern area is quite respected. In fact, we've now committed to shoot 3D over the whole northern part of the uh, basin. So I think that's one area I think we'll see reserves grow uh, in the local chart basin as well. Uh, but the other thing is that we do have a lot of interesting reservoirs that we're really not focused on. You know, if you look at some of the upside of the basin, we're really focused on this one reservoir, which is the Awareware Sandstone. And this is the best stuff. This is the one that tests 2,000 to 3,000 barrels a day. It's 20 to 30 percent porosity, hundreds of millidarcies to darcies of permeability. So that is the best one, and that's the one we should be concentrated on for development. That will anchor our development at, at, at Gamma and Amazon. But there are a number of other very interesting reservoirs that we really haven't uh, gone after. And that once we have a pipeline, once we have surface facilities, those are going to be very interesting reservoirs too. So we, uh, uh, 
Uh, we've seen these sands at the Tweeda Well and even on the other side of the basin, the Atoku Sand. This is probably one of the most interesting reservoirs in that we see these thin sands surrounded by thick, mature source rock. So for those of you who've heard the shale mantra from the U.S. and the Bakken formation, this is exactly what the Bakken is. The Bakken is basically sands that have been the Bakken source rock that are actually draining oil out of the source rock. So uh, the resource potential of this is, is quite big, and we're planning to put a well in there uh, next year to, to test this concept. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to quite a few big oil companies who've come to express interest uh, in the company, and they are, there's a, two of them that are quite focused on this play as being a, a very big add-on, and possibly if we have ultimately the biggest resource in the basin. So we are going to be investigating that. So the cone sand, which we tested mostly on the uh, east side of the basin, the, the Tuco and uh, other places, Again, it's not as good a reservoir. It's more like two to 500 barrel a day tests. Um, probably economic on its own, but uh, if we drill horizontal wells, if we crack it, if we acidize it, we might get those flow rates up to a thousand or more barrels a day. And I think in that case, it will be coming on quite economic. Um, similar type sand down in the Macomb Shales. Uh, we've also got this reservoir, which, uh, as you probably heard me say before, it's terrible reservoir. It's two to four percent porosity. We tested it, it only tested 11 barrels a day. Um, so, you know, normally you look at this and say it's, it's just not worth even messing with. You know, the, uh, the, the reason it is worth considering is there's 700 meters of it in the Twiga number one well. So if you start doing the math, how much oil is in place in there, it's literally billions of barrels potentially on that margin of the basin. And the, the question is, can we unlock it? Can we crack it? Can we do a drill horizontal wells? Can we get that oil out? Even if we only get 5% of 5 billion barrels, you know, that's still 250 million barrels of, of uh, potential reserve we can add to the uh, basin. So all of these, all of these uh, reservoirs will have potential and will be explored, but right now we're focused on this and rightfully so because that's what's going to get us to a, a development. Uh, I'd say the best news we've had this year is really when we've seen a gamma in Amazon. So there's, there's a saying in the oil fields that uh, big fields always get bigger and small fields always get smaller. So Amasing and Gavin are both big fields. And each time we drill a well, we find them getting bigger and bigger. So the old oil and water contact we here was a solid line. Now we've extended it all the way out to here. We've got four wells now in Gavin, which is drilling number four, and the reservoirs continue to look good, continue to look thick. And I think we're getting a lot of confidence in that field now. Uh, Amasing, uh, uh, even better story, we drilled out three wells at Amasing and, and we can't find a, a closure here. So we've now proven oil down to this dotted line and we can't close it off from the rest of the basin. So this whole part of the basin potentially is in communication with what the oil will be found in Amasing. Uh, a good test of that is going to be Kosovan. So the Kosovan we should spud again today or tomorrow. And uh, if this thing has the same pressure and the same reservoir as this, this starts getting very big. So that's going to be an interesting well. If we do find oil put down to the base, we're going to drill a well right about here on the coastal wall uh, to try to do a down with the praise along on that. So I think this is really turning into the sweet spot of the basin. I think we'll see these reserves continue to grow, and it's, it's where the thickest, best reservoir is. And uh, we saw, we've seen that. We've added now, all of this area is going to be added up to our resources. And I think you'll see a significant increase, increase in the resource in the Gambia area. And again, with these three wells, as we move down dip, we actually see the reservoirs thicken and get better quality as we move down dip. So all of those, I think, are, all those things are very positive. We see a similar thing at Amasing, where we've actually drilled three wells now from the same well pad. This is where we're going to do our first extended well test. So these two wells right now, the 2A and the, the, the number one, the original well, are being outfitted to, to basically do our first extended well test. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's probably the single most important thing for building resources in this basin, is looking at the recovery factors of these uh, uh, reservoirs and proving that they're capable of, of water flooding. And that's what this extended well test is, is designed to do. So as I said, Etam, uh, 
we're quite excited and made a nice discovery here. ETOM was always a little bit more complicated structures that had a bunch of faults at the crest and we actually split it into three different fault blocks. We had two big concerns on this uh, prospect. Number one, if this is the source rock kitchen here, this deep area in blue, uh, if oil can't actually migrate and get up to ETOM, oil always is trying to go uphill. It's always trying to escape to the surface. So when it, when it comes up here, the Twigo, which is charged, has come up here to get there. It can't go back down there and then come up again. So in the, in the business, this is called the migration shadow. It basically means that there are structures that just can't access oil because they're not in the right structural position. Um, the good news is we have found oil here, not just the 20 meters of that hay we found, but the whole section was oil stained. So there's a good source rock uh, putting uh, oil into the system. And now we're quite convinced that this little area here is capable of generating oil. So the, the good news of that is that all of these prospects up in the northern part of the basin are now looking quite good, uh, don't have a charge risk. And uh, uh, that's why we elected to uh, expand this 3D up into this area. Uh, also, the, the reservoirs I mentioned, you know, we were seeing a, a thinning of reservoirs we moved north, now we see a nice thickening in the reservoir again. Again, it gives us a lot more confidence that these prospects will have big reservoirs. Uh, it was a complicated uh, track. You can see here on the seismic line, these are all faults. You can actually draw a number of other faults. And uh, I think what we learned is a 2D seismic just isn't good enough to image this. So we actually went from oil stained sands through a fault that we hadn't mapped into wet sands. And we think we're going to have to shoot through 3D to really figure this thing out. So. Uh, again, the 3D crew is right about here right now. They should be finished with the main survey by, uh, uh, say, mid to late October, and then they'll move right up here. So by the first quarter, we'll have that whole thing covered with the 3D, and I think you'll see a, a number of wells drilled up in there because I think this is one of the best areas we've got to grow reserves in the local chart basin uh, that hasn't really been explored yet. Uh, as I said before, Cunyak, uh, uh, sorry, Kosovan is going to be an important well. Uh, we do have 3D on this now. So we've actually been able to map this on a 3D side. You can see this whole grid in here is a 3D side of the lines. So we have a lot of confidence where these faults are and how this structure looks. And uh, again, this well will be spud uh, uh, either today or tomorrow, and uh, uh, we'll see the results of that probably by the end of October. Uh, and, and if we see the same type of reservoir thicknesses here, and again, if it's in communication with this, this could have a, another big impact on uh, reserves in the basin. So really what we're going to be doing on the, the Lacombe Basin is just drilling these appraisal wells. That's the Kosovan well I told you about. Um, Amasing, we're going to be able to add a lot of money just by drilling on both sides of the structure. So reserve operators won't give you credit on drilling in, uh, for reserves until you actually cover the structure with, with appraisal wells. And I think there's maybe 100 to 150 million barrels of, of target to add just by drilling these two appraisal wells. We'll continue drilling on uh, Gamian, and these are the two fields we'll do the extended well tests on. And the extended well test, the, the main reason we're doing that is because there's no real argument about how much oil we've got in place. I think you know, both ourselves, Tullo, our reserve auditors, all see that we have somewhere in the three and a half to four million barrels of oil in place we've discovered. The real question is, how much can we get out? And that's what the recovery factor is. What percentage can we get out? You know, right now our our uh, mid case is about twenty five percent. Our high case is about forty percent. Uh, Tell them our reserve auditors have a slightly lower range of that, and that's that that has a big impact. Uh, for the sake of argument, if we had four billion barrels in place and we had a twenty percent recovery factor, that's eight hundred million. If we have a 30% recovery factor, it goes to 1.2 billion barrels. So that's, that's a very significant uh, um, factor in this. And the bottom line is we just don't have enough data to convince ourselves or our reserve auditors that we know that number very well. The range is actually from 7 to 40%. And that's, that's, that's too big a range. You know, we need to narrow that down. And the way we narrow it down is with these extended well tests where we actually go in and do tests we look at two wells and see how they interfere with each other. We inject water and see if the response is seen at the other wells. And when we get the, re the results of that, we'll start narrowing that range down. Uh, we also have 700 meters of core that we've taken. We're doing uh, laboratory analysis of the core, which also helps us narrow that number down. 
But I think these will be done uh, in the first half of next year. So I think somewhere around the end of the first quarter, we'll start seeing a much narrower uh, ranking of that. Now we believe it should be up in the 30s. If you look at the field right next door in Sudan, similar type of rocks, similar type of oils, they're getting 35 to 40 percent recovery factor. Uh, if you look in Rajasthan, where it shows, uh, where Tim has a, uh, a play again, very similar to this, a rip basin, same type of rock, same type of oil, they're getting 35 to 40 percent. So I think uh, we believe that will ultimately be the number that we get to. But we have to do a little more work and, and show this work to our reserve auditors to get it to have them give us credit. But again, I think the uh, one of the points here is how thick and good this reservoir is. You know, it's 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 20 to 30 percent porosity on average in these two fields. If you look at the thickness of this, over 100 to 200 milli, uh, meters of that thing, and that's not a common thing. You know, these are much thicker than you normally see. Uh, you know, for example, in Uganda, where they have 1.9 billion barrels, the thickest, best well they ever drilled there was 33 meters in that pay. So even these ones that we think are kind of disappointing because they don't have that much pay are still better than the best well that, uh, that was drilled in Uganda. So um, the message here is I think you'll continue to see this grow. We believe wholeheartedly there's well over a billion barrels in this basin. And I think over the next six months to a year, we've got a program to, to try to prove it to ourselves and, and to, uh, to our auditors. Um, in, con in conjunction with that, to, to bring value to these res resources, we can book the resources, but we have to start showing a clear path to the development. Um, you know, the, the single most important issue is the pipeline. Without the pipeline, we have no production. There's no way to produce oil early here. There's no road, there's no rail, there's no other mechanism to do it. So we've been spending a lot of time on the pipeline. I'm very confident now that there will be a joint Kenya and Uganda pipeline. We've joined that pipeline consortium with CNOC, the Chinese national oil company, with Total, Total and ourselves, and we are built, designing and preparing to build a joint pipeline from Uganda through our oil fields to the coast. Uh, we're still finalizing a few things, the exact routing, you see there's two routes on here, and we're still uh, deciding which of those routes is the preferable route. We like the green route because it's the easiest to build as a pipeline company. The government likes the brown route because it fits in with their lab set infrastructure project. The bottom line is it doesn't really matter to us that much. The most important thing is get it settled so we can start doing the detailed engineering, securing the land, and moving the project forward. Um, I, I think the, uh, the, the rate limiting factor now is that detailed thing. Uh, also, there's the environmental social impact. Uh, we will be going through some populated areas and there's some sensitive areas, so we're going to have to make sure we do that properly. Uh, and we do uh, uh, have land access issues. We will have to make sure that the land is, uh, is available and that uh, uh, landowners are properly compensated for, uh, for uh, having a pipeline across. It will be a buried pipeline. You'll actually see nothing on the surface. Um, it'll be a heated, insulated, buried pipeline. So really the only evidence that's even there is a, a little sign about every uh, 100 meters telling you that there's a pipeline down, down below the ground. Uh, the actual field development itself, we're moving ahead on our development plan. Uh, this is a little picture of the annual well site. It's a very flat area, relatively easy for development access, very sparsely populated. There are some hills that you see in the background that the pipeline's going to go up and have to go over. And near the field, those hills are, once you get about a third of the way to the coast, then it just becomes very flat, smooth, and just heading down to the coast. So uh, the field facilities, again, are very plain vanilla. We'll put in a central processing facility with um, accommodation quarters, oil and water separation, oil injection pumps, uh, and uh, uh, most importantly, a lot of heaters. So the only thing odd about this oil is that it's waxy. You have to keep it above about 70 degrees C. Uh, if you let it go below 45 degrees C, you have a 700 kilometer long candle, uh, which is not, not a pleasant thing. Um, we do have the ability to uncandalize it. We have a heat trace coil that goes around the pipeline, and we can always remelt it again. But, uh, the, most, the, better, the better way to handle this is just make sure it always stays hot, not just hot, it comes out of the ground hot. We heat our tankers at the, at the uh, 
uh, pipeline inlet. We heat it several times as it goes down the pipeline. We heat it while it's here on the coast, getting ready to be loaded. And most importantly, we heat it as it comes to this offshore pipeline. That's one of the ones place that will always be heated because as it goes through the cold seawater, uh, that's probably one of the more important parts to keep warm. But this isn't anything strange. I mean, there's a dozen projects around the world that use this type of technology. And, uh, this is kind of all off the shelf stuff. So I'm not expecting anything uh, uh, complicated to, to give us setbacks on this. So the sexy part of Aquagora is still exploration, as I said. And this is really where I think the big growth in this company has the potential of coming. Um, these are the 10 bases that we're going to be attacking in the next 18 months. Seven of them we already have firm wells planned on. The other three we're going to be shooting seismic on, and if we do get some prospects, we will uh, very likely drill those uh, uh, blocks as well in the next 18 months. So I kind of put these into three categories. The, the, the first category is kind of the in and around the local char basin category. You know, the, 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 I, I can say this because I'm, I'm a geologist. Uh, sometimes geology is fairly easy. You just want to go really close to where you find the oil and drill things that look like where you just found the oil. And that's really these basins, and I'll, I'll take you through those. Um, the basin I still like the best is the Turkana Basin. The reason I like it is it's three times the size of any other basin. The, the resources are three times as large. And it's the biggest, thickest, deepest basin. You know, the real risk in this, and where we failed in the Chibahara Basin, is we didn't have source rock. And the source rock is still the number one risk in these rift basins. If the source rock's there, and it's very deep enough to generate, we will have a very rich and prolific basin. Um, we, we failed here. We actually did see some hints of this up here in the uh, um, Savisa and Tatula Gulf. We had good oil shows there, which gives me a lot of encouragement. Um, we have some outlier basins. This is one we're just getting ready to shoot seismic on. This is in our rift basin area of the lot. Uh, it's an unexplored basin. It's never had seismic, never had drilling. The reason I like this basin is because it's got oil seeps on the lake. Uh, there's a number of oil seeps. This is the one where the farmer came to us that had drilled his water wells and found petroleum in his water wells. We've since done source field work here. We found source rocks that are Miocene in age, the same age as the local char source rocks. Very rich, uh, very good looking source rock. So we quite like this basin. It's a, it's a little detached from the others, uh, but we think it's got uh, very good potential. Uh, the Cario Valley block, we've got one nice beautiful prospect in there. Uh, we'll drill that uh, next year. Uh, it's not as big a basin, it's not as deep as some of the others, so it's a little riskier than. Um, uh, one good looking prospect that we can test the concept on. And that's really the key here. So we want to get into these bases and we want to test and see if there's a petroleum system. What we don't want to do is sell out the company or even do a big farm out uh, without knowing whether these bases are productive or not. Because each one of these bases is the same size and prospectivity as the local charter basin. And I think we need, to, we need to find that out sooner than later. So I like showing this map. You know, this is talking again about prosology. So this is what a map made by full tensor radiometry, which is kind of like 3D gravity. We use this as a tool because our area is so large, we can't afford to shoot seismic here. We use FTG or full tensor radiometry to basically give us a, a, a snapshot of what these areas look like and where the basins are. So the color code here is red is high and blue is low. So this is our famous Lake Okachar Basin. What you see, a nice fault that runs along the edge of this basin. You see all of these oil fields located along the edge of that basin, of the string of pearls, and then a, a shallower side uh, without that big fault. Where we have our, uh, our ramp type plays. <coughs> so uh, this basin here looks almost identical to it. You see that nice big fault basin there. You see the blue deep areas. Uh, it's right next to it, the South Cario, Central Cario Basin, and uh, uh, formed at the same time as the local chart basin. So basically a rift basin is just the continent trying to pull apart, and you get these big sags. So this sag looks just like this sag, just the same depth, the same structure. If you move to the north here, the north local chart basin, this one is right on trend in the same basin as this. Uh, just separated by a little granite high. 
So this this here is a, we have a prospect called Tausi, and we'll be drilling that in the first half of next year. Uh, another basin here, Cario North. It doesn't have quite that same morphology of the basin bottom fall, but we've got a very nice prospect here. So I think the message is here: these are our three closest basins that look most genetically similar to the Lokachar Basin, and all three of these are going to be drilled in the next uh, uh, six months. And in fact, <clears throat> the, the Kodo swell, which is the first test in the Cario Basin, um, uh, should spud today or tomorrow. So we're going to know this by the end of October, we're going to have our first hole in there, and I think we've got a lot of high hopes on this. Uh, again, a similar looking basin, there's the deep, We've got this whole string of pearls. Every one of these prospects is a drill ready prospect. If we hit at Kodos, you'll see us come back and drill all of these. We also have this big prospect on the other side of the basin, um, the old one they used to call Mamba. It's now called Lupwa. But this is the single biggest prospect we've got in the entire portfolio. It's a legitimate billion barrel target unto itself 30 kilometers long, 12 kilometers wide, uh, and, and quite a big prospect. So we'll drill this well, then we'll move the rig out and we'll drill in the North Cario Basin, just to the north of it, um, the Ipir prospect, which uh, again used to be called Lazi. A bit of a different prospect in that it's just a simple four-way dip closed anticline. It's just a simple dome. Um, you know, in both directions we have nice closure here. Uh, a bigger prospect, about 340 million barrels, definitely worth drilling. And again, if this hits, it opens up this basin, then we'll you'll see us do uh, more seismic and exploration up there. So this one will be drilled back to back. Uh, we have a good chance of finishing this one before the end of the year as well. And uh, I think these are going to be two uh, critical basin opening wells for us. Um, we are going to move another rig up, uh, and by the fourth quarter we will have split a well in the Turkana Basin. So again, this is the basin I like the most. It's a, the largest basin. Uh, it's got oil seeps on the surface which give us some clues about source rocks. It's got two wells that we drilled up in Ethiopia, Sabisa and Tatule, that had good oil shows in them. So I think we're quite encouraged by this basin. So this basin is actually broke up into several sub-basins that we'll be testing two of those uh, with this drilling campaign. So the first one will be in Domo, uh, which again is a thing that looks an awful lot like our old friends at uh, uh, Gambia and Amasang up against the basin bombing fault. Uh, probably charged from the north from this cooking pot. The second one will actually directionally drill offshore from the shoreline uh, called Samaki, and it's probably going to be charged from this biggest, deepest pot, the cooking pot that I was talking about. You see how thick the, uh, the, the Pliocene is here. The Miocene shales are going to be very, very thick and very deep in here. So, uh, again, I, I, I think this one is, is one of our best shots. Um, we did announce the discovery at Sala for gas. Uh, you can tell from our share price reaction how excited the market was uh, that we found gas in East Africa. Um, just not even a blip on the, on the, uh, on the uh, uh, share price. Uh, I understand that talking to analysts, nobody cares about gas in East Africa uh, except ourselves and the, and the Kenyan government. You know, living in Nairobi, my power cuts out about 20 times a day. About 30% of the uh, Kenya's power is generated by burning of diesel, uh, a lot of it by private generators. And uh, if we could replace that, the government would be very happy. As far as economics of gas, there is a project to do. Put a gas uh, uh, to power plant right on top of the oil field and put a line down here to Isiolo where the main grid is. We've already talked to the government about running that line. We've already talked to G about putting gas turbines in. We've talked to several contractors about doing a gas project. And the only thing we need to guarantee is that we have the gas. So we are doing this well right now. We should have results by the end of this month on that well. If we do it, I think there's some nice money to be made on gas. You know, it won't be a company maker. It won't be nearly as uh, uh, prolific as the oil. But uh, it would be a chance to get on. I think we could be on production on this, uh, producing gas uh, by the end of next year if we're successful with this appraisal well. So it's something we can monetize quickly and get some cash flow in the company, but it won't be, a, uh, it won't be the core value of the company going forward. The, the, the oil will be the core value going forward. So the reason we like these basins, obviously, is each one of them has the same potential as the Lokachar basin, kind of 
one to two billion barrel type potential. Except, of course, my favorite basin, the Turkana Basin, which has about 6.3 billion barrels of potential. So, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about valuation and how the company is valued now. But each one of these basins is potentially uh, of equal value to the Lopichai Basin. It's the same size, and if we can prove it up, we'll get the same value as what we're getting in the Lopichai Basin. So, watch these. I think we'll have five of these in the next six months. Uh, five basin openers drilled, and I think uh, uh, those are the things that are really going to move the stock uh, if we're successful on those. And once again, I'm fairly confident, given the basins we're drilling, we have a very good chance of finding at least one or two of those. So again, this is just kind of a map of what are you going to see from us uh, by the end of the first quarter of next year. You're going to see those five basin opening wells. You're going to see us drill the Kosovan well, which is a, a, a very high impact well in the southern part of the um, basin. Um, we've got another prospect called the Talus Deep, which is related to that uh, unconventional play that I talked to you about uh, earlier. Uh, that'll be in the, in the first quarter of next year. We're also going to be drilling a, a number of appraisal wells, and again, keep moving our resources into from proven, from prospective resource into contingent resource, because eventually that's what we're going to get paid for. You know, when, when an oil company comes and does a deal with us. They won't pay us for exploration volumes. They won't even pay us for perspective. They'll pay us for the hard value of the, of the contingent research resources we have. And if we have a pipeline, and if we have a development plan, those turn into proven and probable reserves. And that's what oil companies want, and that's what they'll pay us for. So uh, in conjunction with this, we'll be doing our extended well tests. We'll be getting the pipeline sorted out and we'll be doing a development plan. I think both of those, all of these things will be ready to go by, uh, if not quite the end of the first quarter, slightly into the second quarter. And I think that's the time we really start in earnest uh, a, a, a process to bring in a, a bigger company to, to join us in the development. And I think a lot of options are open there, whether it's a viable company, farm inventories for development, um, perhaps mergers with companies with cash flow and production, um, even doing the development ourselves. If somebody else pays for the pipeline, uh, there's no way, reason we can't stay in and raise enough money to do a stage development. Um, I think we all like the idea of a big cash payout uh, from some Tanganyika shareholders in the crowd that uh, uh, probably were quite happy when we uh, got that cash payment uh, for Tanganyika. Um, and I think that's still our preferred route. But I think we have to keep all options open and, and investigate you know, what is going to give the best value to the shareholders. So uh, I think next year you'll see us working on that plan. I think we need to do an industry deal by the end of next year. So I think uh, that's what we're working towards. So even though we have almost a year worth of funding, the number one question I've heard get asked already is, how, how much money do you have in the bank? Uh, when is it going to last? And how, are you gonna, how long are we going to last? And how are you going to get more? So again, this is something that doesn't keep me up at night. If you remember last year, QE2 was coming off and people were telling me we weren't going to be able to raise any money uh, in a day and a half, but essentially we raised, not that we had $962 million committed. I've already got most of my big shareholders just telling me, if you need more money to see us to the end of 2016, let me know, we'll, we'll write a check. So um, the one thing I hate doing is raising money at a share price below where I raised it last time. So last time we did it at $8.35, we're significantly below that right now. Uh, I think the only thing that's going to push us back over that number is a basin opener. So I think as we build these next five basin openers, if we have success in that, if the market reacts, I think we may put a little money in the bank just to make sure we get through 2015 into 2016 and have enough money to, to, to get our industry deal done. So uh, again, we're a big budget, $820 million, uh, $800 $14 million. Uh, our share is about 348. I don't expect that to change significantly next year. I think 80 million a quarter is kind of our, our, our burn rate. So uh, again, you have $350 million in the bank at the end of June, and that sees us into June or July of next year. So uh, I don't think we're too uh, worried about raising money, and I don't think we'll do it uh, until next year unless we see a nice event of a, a basin opener and a $9, 10 share price. Um, I do maybe 
I want to introduce Alex Budden. Maybe if you can uh, uh, wave to the crowd and uh, tell them uh, uh, Alex is our uh, Vice President of uh, External Relations. And he's working full time on all the things we've talked about before. And uh, as, I, as I've told you before, this is probably the most important part of our business. And I think it's probably the biggest risk that we've got in our business. If we don't do this right, it doesn't matter if we do everything else right, we will fail in this country. So we spend a lot of time and effort on community engagement, uh, community relations, uh, what we like to call our social license to operate. So we're doing a lot of initiatives. Uh, the uh, communications uh, is always a big thing. So we've opened three offices there. We are trying to get people's expectations and communications uh, set up better. And I think Tullo, after last year when we had some issues with some of the local uh, people wanting jobs and wanting uh, contracts, I think this is a much more open and transparent process now, so I think we're making uh, movement on that. And really, this is the most important thing for the local people. You know, when people look at resources in Africa, um, you know, you, you hear the term oil curse. Oil curse is a very simple thing that says, when resources are found in an African nation, the people on the ground don't always benefit. Uh, and there are countries where you could point to where you say maybe they should never have found resources or their lives would be better off. Now the reason those places are like that is, one, because of corruption, because there's a small group of people who take all of those resources and keep them for themselves, and two, because there's not an adequate way to distribute the, res the revenue, distribute the jobs, and distribute the benefit of the, of the oil. And this is what we spend a lot of time on, trying to make this a positive uh, experience for as many Kenyans as possible. <laughs> So one thing you need to do to do that is uh, capacity building. You know, the area we're in, in the, in the Turkana region, uh, are all pastoralists. They don't have a lot of the skill set they need to join in with us and, and work in the oil industry. So we're setting up a vocational training center where we can teach uh, skills like auto mechanics, uh, welding, um, uh, refrigeration, and you know, all of the side jobs that local inhabitants can do and, and, and put businesses together. We're putting in the entrepreneurial center, teaching them that, um, you know, for instance, a, a group of six women that came to us, they want to build a bakery. So we can give a micro loan to the women to build a bakery. Um, they can, we can sign a long-term contract to take their bakery bits, and they will make uh, an enterprise that not only uh, helps us, but they should be able to expand that bakery and, and make goods for the uh, local people. Um, but all, of, all we try to, the, the main focus for us is sustainability. Like we went in and it was suggested we should buy fruits and vegetables from the locals as opposed to importing them from Nairobi. Sounds like a good idea, right? But if we buy all the fruits and vegetables, the local people don't have fruits and vegetables and the price of fruits and vegetables go up dramatically in the area. So um, the better thing to do is, again, to build a greenhouse, you know, get a group of people, fund a greenhouse, increase vegetable and fruit production in it where they can do it year round uh, without worry about the um, drought and other things. And then once again, it's something that benefits them above and beyond the oil industry. So we spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, we also are spending time training higher level. So 11 people have just been sent to the UK for training in courses like petroleum engineering, uh, petrol, uh, geology, geophysics, uh, to start taking that um, uh, higher level jobs. And that really is our goal, is to replace as many foreigners as we can with Kenyans. Uh, and the real benefit to this area is, is going to be employment with the oil companies, not going to be employment with the oil companies. We will employ, uh, I think right now we're employing with ourselves and our contractors about 2,800 people. So we are by far the biggest employer in the area. But really the ancillary businesses um, that not only benefit us, but we, we, we like to call them sticky businesses, uh, they'll stick around after we're gone and they'll improve the, the infrastructure and the lives of the people that are there. So again, we've spent a lot of time on this. Uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, engaged uh, with a lot of Swedish media. We've taken a couple of media trips. We've taken some CSR representatives from some of the big funds down. And I think, uh, you know, we'd like to be transparent on this. We're very proud of our record here. Uh, some of you had read some negative press uh, about us. I think uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would take exception with all of that's written there. I think we're doing things the right way, and I truly believe that resources can be a blessing to the country. Uh, it's only people that can make them into a curse. And uh, not only ourselves, but 
the other oil companies, the World Bank, the UK government, the, the foreign aid, um, NGOs, we're all working together to try to make this a, a very positive experience for Kenya. So to summarize, I, you know, I think we do, um, you know, I, I challenge people to come up and tell me a better exploration acreage uh, around the world uh, onshore, and uh, uh, I have yet to have anybody show me one that I would trade for this. I think this is this is probably the best collection of blocks in the world as far as exploration upside. Um, you know, we do have one nice basin that we have begun to de-risk. We've made uh, eight discoveries uh, here out of ten wells, uh, very high success rate. Uh, we will be finding more oil there, and uh, almost more importantly, we'll be taking all of these fields, and uh, I think we have a very good chance of doubling the uh, uh, recoverable reserves in there. Uh, given the program we've got for appraisal and extended well testing and core analysis. Um, but again, the, the big story here is the new basins. You know, this is what's really going to be moving the stock, and you'll see that that's what we're really focused on in the next year, is to get out and drill as many of these new basins as we can, because we see that as the real growth story. So, uh, despite our share price uh, of today, you know, we do have 27 analysts covering us. Their average target price is Twelve dollars and twenty-four cents, about eighty pounds. So uh, you know the uh, the analysts, I think, know the, the stock very well. Are still quite bullish. And what I will say is that almost all of them don't include anything for the new basins. This is all value on the local chart basin. So any new basin we add has that same type of value potential. Value. I'm quite confident uh, that we will continue to add in the local chart and that the baseline value you're seeing today, there's almost no downside to this. The worst case scenario is we don't find any more on the local chart. If you put any reasonable value on those barrels that are in the local chart we found today, so we don't increase the recovery factor, we don't find any new fields, uh, we're well above today's baseline value. So the upside in the stock right now is in the local chart, very high probability of moving up there, and free a free ride on uh, 10 of the most interesting looking bases in the world that we're going to be drill drilling wells on in the next 18 months. And uh, uh, I always have to show this side too, just to show you I'm not just uh, dreaming that, that, that this is something we've done in the past in the Lundy group. You know, in, not only in the companies we've sold, Tanganyika and Valkyries, uh, but in the countries we hold, uh, Lundy Petroleum being the, 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 the real flagship of that. You know, our average share price increase over the past 12 years is 39 times the money. We've, we've gone from 128 million to 15 billion of uh, um, uh, value just in the oil companies alone. This doesn't include the mining companies. The mining companies have a similar uh, valuation. So I think uh, uh, we're learning how to do this, and I think Africa Oil has the same type of potential uh, uh, to grow in these type of ways as all these other companies do. So I'll, I'll leave this, leave you to uh, read the uh, cautionary's tale of uh, uh, Edward Ledger and maybe once more show of hands how many people are happy where the share price is today so they can go out and buy. No? No? <laughs> well, a few more hands. But, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I am excited about the company and I think we are in as, as good a place as we've ever been. And I think we put in a lot of hard work to get these new basins ready to drill. And I think over the next uh, six months to a year, you're going to see some, some good results, uh, not only on the local chart basin, but fingers crossed, I think one or two uh, new basins, uh, uh, very high likelihood that will be in local numbers. So, thanks again. I think we've got uh, time for questions. If, uh, any, any questions from the audience? Uh, you are shown uh, the base is a sort of uh, valleys in the rocks. Yeah. Uh, and uh, normally something at the left. How do you avoid? I'll start from the beginning again. Okay. Uh, you show your, your faces as a uh, sort of, um, uh, should you say, open areas or they are not open, but still uh, not rocks of the hard part. How can you avoid that uh, the oil is slowly flowing out to places uh, where they already are pumping up the oil? 
Det er det. Kanilas. Kanilas pump. I think Kanilas oil pump uh, next to us is about a thousand miles away in Sudan. So there's no oil ever produced in any of these countries. So we're a long way from there. But the, the real issue about the, the basins leaking is a significant issue. You know what you need is shales in there. So you know we, we and we don't know that until we drill the wells. We're just guessing. So, you know, some people, when I, when we drilled the well Sabisa to Tule, I got very excited because we had 400, 500 meter thick shale on top. That's one of the necessary components to find oil. If you don't have a seal, there are basins around the world. And in fact, the Bahasi well, if you remember that from the Cretaceous, that was sand from top to bottom. The biggest problem there, I think, uh, maybe we didn't have source, but we certainly didn't have any seal. So, any <coughs> oil that would just be generated just Rushes to the top. I mean, as I see, our nearest friend, <laughs> who is down here, is drilling and pumping. As I understand, not too far away. How do we know that our very top level? And no, nobody's drilling and pumping in that country. Going over. There's no one drilling or pumping anywhere near us, within a thousand miles. I think the, the Petroleum Act is before the Parliament now. Uh, I think we've been through five or six revisions of it. And COGA, which is the Kenyan Oil and Gas Association, which is all of the oil companies in Kenya, it's headed by TALO. We're members of it and we, we're quite active. In general, we're quite happy with it because it's, it's putting forth a lot of regulations that we're missing in the industry. So I think it's giving us a good framework. Uh, the positives of it are that uh, um, it, we've been told over and over again that they're not going to change our contract terms, that our production sharing terms, our profit splits, our cost recovery are sacrosanct. And that's advice they're getting from everyone. Contract stability is very important to this. One of the key components of this bill is uh, revenue share. So uh, of the government share, they have a, a mechanism in place to take the revenue from that's generated and have it not all just sit in Nairobi, but to be distributed down to the county level and eventually to the local level. So that's all in the new bill that every group will have its share of the oil revenues. And again, that gets back to that oil curse that you want to make sure there's a mechanism that all the money just isn't held in the central government. It makes its way out to the population. I think the only negative that uh, we've seen in the bill is uh, they've been talking about capital gains tax. But capital gains tax, uh, they haven't come down on a figure yet. We've seen figures anywhere from 5% to 37%. And I think we've, uh, we've been lobbying quite strongly as uh, an industry that uh, high capital gain tax are bad for the country. You know, number one, it discourages guys like us from coming in. You know, only a small part of their country has been explored. If they want aggressive get little explorers like us, a low capital gains tax should do that. Number two, it encourages us guys like us to stay. So if, it, if they pass a high capital gain tax, we're not willing to give away our, our uh, upside to the Kenyan government. So it really kind of forces us to make a decision maybe we want to stay. And of course, if you're a post government, you shouldn't want us to stay. You know, we're good explorers, but we don't have the deep pockets, the low cost of capital, or the uh, expertise to develop oil fields like those shells and the Exxons and the Totales of this world. So there's a net natural progression, and, and you want that to happen. So I, I'd say the capital gains is something we, we're, we're quite focused on. You know, I still believe that a, a, a rational number is going to come out of it. You know, if it's five to ten percent, uh, it will be unpleasant, but uh, uh, we can probably live with it. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that we would like to get sorted out. You know, one way or the other, the most important thing is knowing what that number is. Uh, the problems with our friends uh, Heritage and, uh, uh, and Tunnel had in Uganda is they went to them with a deal and then started negotiating capital gains tax. I guarantee if you walk into the office, 
with a bag of $4 billion from Shell Oil, and you say, how much of this do you want? You know, we all know what the answer to that is, as much as we can possibly get. So the important thing is, we know what that is going in. And I'm, 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 I wouldn't say I'm confident, but I'm optimistic that uh, we will be able to get that number down to a reasonable level where it really won't impact our decision whether to uh, do a farm out or to do a cash sale. Uh, has the political political risks uh, changed uh, since the election? Um, the question about political risk changing since the election. I think, uh, in general, the central government we feel very confident about. They're very business oriented. Uh, Uru Kenyatta has uh, uh, been quite supportive, and he surrounded himself with a cabinet that is, is quite pro business. So I think, from that standpoint, and like contract sanctity and, and the ability to get permits, uh, ability to move the prospect forward, uh, we're quite pleased. Um, from a security standpoint, Al-Shabaab you know, has been a constant uh, uh, source of trouble uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I live about less than a mile away from the uh, Westgate Mall, so I, I uh, experienced that personally. Um, you know, you can't really protect yourself against those type of terrorist attacks, and we see them in uh, other parts of the world as well. Um, you probably saw they did kill the leader of the uh, Al Shabaab last week on uh, a U.S. airstrike, and he was the planner of the Westgate bomb, uh, Westgate mall attack. So uh, I think you're seeing Al Shabaab being weakened, but uh, again, you know, uh, dangerous animals, uh, wounded animals can be the most dangerous. So I don't think we've seen the end of Al Shabaab attacks, but I do think the world is now, you know, with ISIS and uh, Al Shabaab, and I think. The, the war on uh, radical fundamentalism, uh, terrorist-based attacks, uh, is being joined. And I think, uh, I think they will win eventually, but I think they, uh, they may take a little more time to get it uh, sorted out. So, uh, otherwise, you know, security in Kenya still is always an issue. Uh, the police force needs to be beefed up, and I think that the country understands that. And there are a lot of people there that uh, are uh, uh, focused on that and, and trying to help them to do that. Hi, you said you were very excited about uh, the Tukarma Basin. How about if you hit the Tukarma Basin with the first well? Uh, do you see a problem about the perspectives, about uh, environmental effects of bird life, uh, because the lake is uh, very much bird life? Or? Yeah, that is one area we're going to have to be very um, careful about from an environmental standpoint. So we're drilling our first wells on the shore. Um, you know, drilling offshore, I think, is going to have to have a solution that we feel extremely confident about. So we have been, we've got a little more time in that basin. We've got about five years left on that contract. So we've been doing some preliminary investigation about barge-mounted drilling. And barge-mounted drilling that's basically been acceptable in the United States and has been used in environmentally sensitive areas around the world. So we're going to have to convince ourselves that we're going to have uh, a very fail-safe system to go and drill offshore. Uh, we like the fact that we can just test it onshore. If the basins don't work out, then they don't work out. But uh, my guess is we have enough encouragement that we're going to eventually want to go offshore uh, in there. And I think that is one we're going to have to be very sensitive and very careful about uh, because it is a it's a unique uh, uh, environment. Uh, it's also a unique uh, archaeological environment. You know uh, that so the Samaki. Um, well that uh, we're planning to drill is about 20 kilometers south of where they found the Tertanabo, which is probably the most complete um, uh, homo habilis fossil ever found on Earth. So we've been working quite uh, closely with Richard Leakey and his group. We actually have archaeologists that work with us to make sure that we're not going into sensitive areas. And uh, we actually flew the Leakey family up there to look at our uh, well sites and, and, and make sure that they're okay with the way we're doing it. Well, so far, we've had quite a bit of support from the Niki group, but um, both from the uh, wildlife and, uh, and, and uh, uh, archaeological and just an overall environmental, um, this is an area we're going to have to be extra careful because it's a, it's a sensitive environment. So if you hit the first, well, the most prospective areas could be offshore? Yeah, the biggest structures we've seen are offshore. So we, we have, uh, I can go back quickly. 
So we'll probably follow this up. This is successful. This was onshore too. Uh, we'll probably follow up with that. Uh, if we hit this one, we can drill this well to far away um, from the onshore as well. But like this is one of our better looking prospects. You know, this map's cut off, but there's a number of big uh, leads out there. We haven't shot seismic over the whole basin yet. We wanted to shoot enough seismic to basically test the basin on the, on the flanks. Uh, but the next thing we'll do is go out and shoot a more detailed seismic grid. So, again, uh, uh, I'm quite confident we can do this uh, in an environmentally friendly way, but uh, we're going to make sure we put extra safeguards on to, to, to make sure we do it right. Because if we had an oil spill in this lake, uh, it, would, it would finish us uh, from exploring there and have a lot of detrimental effects uh, on, on the company in general. Any other questions? Yeah, so you gave us a lot of on horn. Horn patrol. Yeah, you know, every time I meet you here, I tell you that we're still percolating horn and we've got opportunities. And Jane, Jane Phillips, who's, uh, we call him the godfather of uh, Africa oil, he's the geologist that recommended most, if not all, of the blocks that we have in Africa oil. Uh, he's been uh, spending the last year or so looking around Africa. Uh, we've gone down the path on a couple of deals. We came pretty close on a couple of deals, but uh, we haven't closed anything yet. So we do have a couple more deals in the mix right now that we're getting close on. There's no guarantee, but we do think Horn is going to be a, a, a new venture broker candidate. You know, if, uh, if, if, if it comes to pass that at the end of next year we sell Africa oil for a, a large profit, I think you'll see a lot of us migrating over there and uh, trying to build up another Africa oil well. Uh, uh, using the horn on that shell. Uh, I have a question. Uh, all the employees in Africa also normally uh, own some sort of stocks and things like that. Um, the, the question of uh, are we normally owners of stock? Um, I am. I've got, uh, I think, about 1.2 million shares in that neighborhood. Um, most of our employees do have some stock, but uh, most of them are motivated primarily by options. So uh, we pay fairly small amounts. Uh, our CEO, uh, I can tell you, our COO took a, 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 a two thirds pay cut to come and work for us. Uh, we don't like paying big salaries. We pay enough salary that somebody can live a comfortable living, but uh, uh, we like to align our shareholders and our employees. So when the shareholders make money, we make money. The shareholders don't make money, we don't make money. So that's the primary motivation for employees is, is their options and, and the value of their options. Okay, thanks for the presentation. Um, obviously, obviously, it's been delayed a couple of times, but can you give us uh, Estimation on where we can expect the uh, resource update, the resource report, and perhaps why it's been delayed a couple of times because I think that has created some security on the market. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the resource, the question about the resource report, it has been delayed. It's basically been waiting for the Amazon and uh, Gamia appraisal routes because those are the most important thing in the, that's going to come out of the resource report. So we've been waiting to make sure they get all the data they can, and you know, we'll be honest with you, we, we like to maximize that number, so we have been working with our resources auditor to try to maximize that number. So we will release something by the end of the month, and uh, um, uh, you know, I can't, can't really give too much guidance on what that will be, because we're not finalized yet. We're still working on that recovery factor. The main, the main uh, technical discussion we've got with our uh, reserve auditor is, is over the recovery factor and the range of recovery factors that is reasonable. So, but we will come out with it before the end of the month. So you can't give us an estimation of, you know, what range there is? I think that's selective disclosure. <laughs> if I tell you that, then I have to put on a press release and tell everybody in the world that. So. But, uh, uh, can I, I guess I can say, uh, if, if you believe the tunnel number, we'll have a number that's higher than that. I guess I can't say how much higher.
there is a disturbing uh, changes in stock prices of consumers in Canada and also in the Swedish markets. And that could be caused to be normal trade. Or we'll call it a normal trade. <laughs> I suppose it's disturbed the market. But it could also be a big partner who is uh, in this way gathering lots of uh, ownership in the company. As I understand it now, there are uh, quite a few big owners. But uh, uh, it's possible then in a certain situation that one or two of these big owners sell to this one who has gathered enough to not get a majority of here or maybe a majority. But to give some words about how you shall look upon this and what we have to expect because it could be possible to take over more or less the rights which the company have to these always by making yourself I don't know me, I don't know you know how to be me. I wish I had enough money to take over after a while. And uh, therefore, I cannot understand why the company already is pumping up and selling oil. Well, we don't have a pipeline, so we can't sell oil. But until the pipeline's gone, there's no way to sell oil. But as far as your question about is anybody going into the stock and going out, you know, we do have a share register that shows all of our major holders. Anybody that goes above 9.9% .9 is legally obliged to, to become a, a reporting issuer and has to report that whole day. So, you know, if, if a big oil company were coming in and trying to get a position in the stock, I think you'd see the stock going up, not going down. So, uh, no one's ever taken over a Lundy oil com uh, Lundy company of any kind against its will. Um, you know, Lundy Mining, they tried a couple of years ago, but. Uh, uh, you know, even though Lucas doesn't have a, as big a holding as he has in London Petroleum, um, shall we say friends and family and the, the people that have been our long-term investors, I think it would be very difficult to put a bid in to try to do a, a hostile takeover of uh, London of uh, Africa. Oil. All right. Any, any last questions? Yeah, one more. I, I think you are making a great job of uh, Thank you for that. And uh, this pipeline, uh, is it big enough now for taking all that oil from those various countries and your own fields? Uh, couldn't you take the bags out of the oil uh, while you are taking it up? No, the wax actually has value for the refinery. Um, so it's a paraffin, so it's a hydrocarbon chain, and they can actually break it down and make it into things. So you don't really want to take it out of the uh, of the oil, and it's, and it's very difficult to do. And then you have this mountain of wax. You know, some of you may have seen uh, in uh, uh, in uh, Kazakhstan they have a field that has about 23 percent sulfur. They've been taking this sulfur out of the oil for about 15 years, and they literally have four mountains of sulfur. Um, that are about a thousand meters high, and then some, you got to do something with that eventually. So um, the size of the pipeline, we don't have to commit until basically the day we order steel, which is probably going to be towards the end of 2015, more likely early 2016. So we can size the pipeline. You know, if we, if we open up another basin, uh, if the Sudanese get organized and want to join us, uh, if, 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 if we find more oil uh, in the Lokachar basin. We can literally upsize that pipeline at the 11th hour. The other thing we can do is kind of over design the pipeline. Right now, we're looking at a say, 350, 500,000 barrel a day pipeline to handle 250,000 barrels a day from Uganda and anywhere from 100 to 250,000 from us. Um, we'll know a lot more before you know, we get to that how much oil we'll be able to deliver. Um, but you can also upsize the pipeline a little bit. Uh, pipelines. You can double the capacity of a pipeline for only about 20% more cost. And it has to do with the, the pipeline diameter, it, it's, the, it's the surface area of the pipeline, which is 2 pi r. So the cost of steel is only about 25% of the pipeline. And to change from, say, a 28 inch to a 36 inch, which doubles the size of the throughput, 
um, only increases the pipeline about 20 to 25 percent. So then you just need to add more pump stations. So you need three, four more pump stations. So we have a lot of flexibility on that. We would love Sudan to join us. You know, the, 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 the math is very simple on our pipeline. If Uganda, it's about two and a half billion, plus or minus, from our pipeline to the coast. If Uganda joins us, they pay half. So we say 1.25 billion. If Sudan joins us, we go down to a third of that. So the more people, the merrier. Uh, and it, it certainly makes sense to build one pipeline instead of building two or three pipelines. But uh, we do have a lot of flexibility in that, and, and we can keep that uh, right up until we order the steel. Thank you very much.